Awesome. Thank you, Wendy. Welcome to St. Matthew United Methodist Church. We are absolutely excited and pumped that you guys are here at St. Matthew. We are a Christ-centered family of grace where all are wanted. We are committed to becoming who Christ says we are, growing, living, and sharing God's love one relationship at a time. Will you join us now as we come to sing praises to him? already been done you can add to his blood it was once for all father gave his son forever we are changed by the miracle of grace throughout history the father's life remains Amen. And all of God's people said, Amen. Well, welcome to St. Matthew. We're glad you're here. I just have a few announcements for you this morning. Thank you, Praise Band. That was absolutely awesome. Thanks for letting me sing with you. Uh, that only happens in a blue moon. And if you heard me sing, you know why. Uh, I want to encourage you guys as we go through our announcements today 
to stay in touch with one another and keep up with email prayer requests. We are sending these out sometimes daily, and we absolutely want to be sure that you are in that thread. If you're not on our mailing list and you want to be on our email list, all you have to do is call us or uh, send us an email to our, our Facebook account or to our church office. Uh, and then we will absolutely add you and put you on to that as well. But do keep in touch with each other, you know, because, I mean, make the simple phone call, uh, send a card, uh, whatever it takes for you to reach out. God may be bringing someone to mind right now that in the midst of what we've been going through, you've not heard from or you've not been able to spend enough time in conversation with, so just give them a call. Prayer warriors continue to pray together remotely. Thank you guys for doing that. Mondays and Thursday mornings. So uh, God bless you and your efforts. And thank you for covering our community and our church, our loved ones, and those that we don't know in prayer. I want to encourage you to go to our St. Matthew YouTube channel. New content is going up there every day. All you need to do is when you're on Google, search S-M-U-M-C Lubbock YouTube and you'll get a hit and go right there. It's fun. We're beginning a new men's Bible study Monday night. And so we're going to meet on the off weeks Mondays uh, opposite of the women. So they have the first and third. We're going to do the second and fourth Mondays. I promise, guys, we won't continue this into football season. But through the summer, we're going to call it the tool shed. And we are going to be looking at things that Christ gives us as tools to use in our daily living together uh, as men and leading our families and being part of our community and making an impact for God, those types of tools uh, that we need. So that's tomorrow night at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Zoom information will be emailed to all of you. If you have a brother that you want to come and they don't come to our church or they're not on our email list, you can go ahead and forward the information uh, that I send you this afternoon. Brown bags and Bibles, Wednesday noon to 1. Uh, that's gaining lots of traction. It's not new anymore. Uh, great, uh, great teaching is going on. We pick uh, someone every week that, uh, that is on a uh, line that we listen from, and we also do uh, a new praise song uh, every day and so we, or every Wednesday, and so we're just excited about you coming. And also, don't let that just be a just-you event. Invite other people as well. Uh, an upcoming Zoom uh, fellowship get-together for us is called the Fam Fair. F-A-M, fam, as M, as in Mary, fam, fair. So be thinking about sharing something interesting about your family members. That's this coming Tuesday, June 9th at 7 p.m. You'll be getting information about that as well. Kids, if you're looking for content, parents, you're looking for a website to point them to, uh, to do small lessons, to enjoy godly crafts, sermonforkids.com. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, it's great. There's all kinds of content up there. You can look at the current week that they're studying, or you can go back and look for past studies as well. Be in prayer for our ongoing ministries, our first responders in Aspen Village as well. We don't forget them. Those are always at the forefront of our mind as we uh, love on and care for each other. Also, let me just again applaud you guys on your giving financially. Thank you so much. Remember, Aplos, we are online where you can give online if you want to. That is located not only on our website, but also on our Facebook page. And you're seeing the URL, I think, right up here if I'm pointing the right direction right now with our overlay. That's right. Thank you, Stephanie. That's awesome. Right. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Kayla Moore, June 12th. Woo, woo. Well, since Kayla's with us today back there running slides, we're going to sing happy birthday to her. Are y'all ready? One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Y'all give Kayla a hand. We just love the addition. Thank you for all your help, Kayla. Happy anniversary, Matt and Pam Ryan. I don't know where they are. They're not in Lubbock County. They are out celebrating their anniversary somewhere. They are on the road. June 9th is their anniversary, so we're super, super stoked and excited about that. Guys, love you. That's the announcements. Enjoy our worship service today together. Our hymn of praise this morning is number 362, Nothing But the Blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes 
Our affirmation of faith this morning is the Apostles' Creed. Please join me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our hymn of inspiration this morning is number 364, Because He Lives. Because he lives. 
Thank you, Carol. As we come to our, uh, uh, our prayer time today, um, I just want us to focus a little bit on, uh, I know what's going on in uh, you know, our community and in the world around us. There's several things that you know, has us at um, a point of anxiety and also a point of just where we are uh, uh, just wondering, you know, where. <laughs> What, did, what happened? Where did everything go? You know, why are things getting uh, the way that they are getting? So we're just going to spend a moment in, in silent prayer together, um, and we are just going to soak in uh, to receiving God's uh, power and his love, uh, ask for his discernment and grace and understanding, his empathy, um, and ask for uh, his guidance, uh, and that... Uh, that really just permeate every inch of us where we know that he is in control and we are not alone where we know that he has us and that uh, there is nothing uh, that is out there that we could ever face together um, that um, that would uh, take us uh, to a place that we would ever be without him he will always be with us so join me as we just spend some time in silent prayer together Lord, we adore you for who you are, God, for the, uh, for the magnificence and for the omniscience, uh, Lord, of all knowing and all being, Father. Uh, you have called us, you have chose us, you have picked us, Father. Uh, Lord, everything, all of your mercies, all of your grace, all of your energy, you gave your Son for us, Father. And so, Lord, we recognize you, we praise you today we we uh we kneel and we bow to you right now as we come to adore who you are father lord we confess god lord we say straight up we tell the truth here with our hearts god and with our words lord that we we are not always the people you want us to be father we are not always uh, we are not always true to the, to the design that you made inside of us father Lord, uh, we have sharp words with each other. Father, we hurt each other. God, we judge each other. Lord, uh, we sometimes hate one another. Father, it's just not the way you wanted your children to be in relationship to each other. Father, we confess, God, that we doubt. We confess, Father, that we aren't always sure, Father. Many of us sometimes, maybe we just don't always believe, God. But, Lord, it's in that confession that we know, 
Lord, that you say to us, you love us, you want us anyway, God. You have paved the way, Father, for our shortcomings and our failings, Father. You have paved the way for when we are short with each other and, and when, we don't, uh, when we don't care for and love on each other the way that we should, when, when we don't pay you the respect that we should, or when we don't love or care for you the way that we should, God. Uh, Lord, uh, you paved the way there smooth and straight for us through what you did on the cross for us through your son, God. And so, Lord, man, I mean, how can we say, Father, that uh, we love you? How can we say, Father, that we thank you in so many ways for just rescuing us and saving us and for what Christ did making us right in your sight, Lord? So it is in that confession that we can also come with great thanksgiving to you, God, being thankful not only, Father, for the others that are around us, thankful for the relationships that you have built around us, thankful for the people that you have given us in our lives, Lord, but also thankful for what you are in our lives and what you do through them for us and what you do through us for them, God. As our relationship goes, Father, with you, and Lord, we pray for that relationship between us and you, Father, so our relationship goes with others. And Lord, right now, we pray for that relationship between us and others. And Father, as that relationship goes between us and others and lord we continue to pray for that relationship between us and others father so our relationship goes with you and we continue to pray for the, that relationship between us and you father and so lord uh, in that thanksgiving we also know father that you know the needs of our hearts father you know the needs of our soul father you know the needs that we have financially father you know the needs that we have emotionally Father, you know the needs for companionship. You know the needs that we have uh, for uh, dissuading doubt. Father, you know the needs that we have for grace and for mercy. And you know the needs that we have to give grace and mercy, Father. All of those needs, even the ones that we haven't told you, Father, you know. Even the ones that we don't know that we have. We're just missing something. You know what that is, God. And so, Lord, we lift those needs up to you, Father. We adore you. We confess our sins to you. We are thankful for you, God. We uh, give you, uh, you, you supply us our needs. You are the great giver to our lives of whatever, maybe not whatever we want, but definitely whatever we need, God. And it's in all of that we, that we can come to pray as you taught your disciples to pray, pray by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. I do know that prayer. Last time I did it, I left a line out. And so uh, I even wrote it out here, but I got lost in that. But the Lord is blessing us today. The Lord is with us today. And it's in that blessing as we come to our tithe uh, time today that we just we really want to just ask uh, the, the, the Father in heaven for us to grant us even just more patience this week, Lord. I don't know, we've asked for that before, but we're going to do a double dose. And so we just pray that our gift will be to other people patience. Our gift will be to other co-workers patience. Our gift will be to other family members patience. That our gift will be to people that we don't even know in traffic, <laughs> on the loop, right, patience, yeah. Uh, we ask that uh, as, we, uh, as we come to... Uh, um, uh, bless the money that we take in that it would go towards his kingdom work that we also would ask God to bless us with patience the fruit of the spirit patience Lord thank you guys for giving so much and we pray right now uh, that every single penny goes towards uh, kingdom work here in this community and may we do that work in love and in patience with each other father god we thank you so much lord for every dime that we are blessed with it's yours anyway so we ask that you bless it god and that father that you would turn that tenfold twentyfold thirtyfold into building relationships here uh, in your name for you god lord may we love on people that have never been loved on before may we care for people that no one cares about may we seek out the people that no one sees father Every penny translated into those acts that we do 
for you, God. So, Lord, bless this. Bless our patience. Bless our money. It's in your name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Did I leave anything out of the order of worship? Okay, all right. I don't have it in front of me, so I'm just thinking that maybe I left a couple of things out. If you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn into Romans chapter 8. Remember that we are in a series uh, in Romans chapter 8 where we are really going verse by verse. Uh, last week we looked at Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 27. And we talked about hope versus despair. Uh, today, we're going to study something that you're probably very familiar with, one of the most well-known promises in Scripture, if not the most well-known promise in Scripture. So here we go in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. Follow along with me in your Bible. I'm reading out of the NIV, or if your Bible app, uh, whatever you're using today. And it goes on to say this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. The firstborn, our oldest brother, our, uh, the oldest, the firstborn among us, as we are uh, his brothers and sisters. And, and those he predestined, he also called. And then those he called... He also justified, and then those he justified, he also glorified. <laughs> now, I, I don't think it's a big secret, church family, that I really miss sports. You know, uh, several weeks ago, uh, after uh, all sports had been suspended, I was flipping through the channels, and uh, I found on ESPN where they were playing the 2006 National Football Championship. If y'all remember that one, it was that year hosted by the Rose Bowl. It was between USC and the University of Texas. Now, when I found it and I tuned into it, it was in the final quarter of the game. So I immediately texted Jill, our resident Longhorn here, uh, and told her about what was on. Uh, now, just to say something about that, I, I am a Longhorn fan unless they are playing against Texas Tech, but that is obviously for another sermon. Yeah, uh, I, I watched the game live in 2006. I remember uh, when it was on. Uh, it ended up being the highest rated ball, uh, bowl college series game in TV history and is often considered the greatest college uh, football national championship game of all time. Unless, of course, uh, you were a USC fan. <laughs> and I've, I've got some friends uh, watching from uh, Los Angeles. Uh, Peter, sorry about that. Texas won 41 uh, to 38. Uh, now, as I was watching the replay a few weeks ago, I discovered something about myself. I found it more enjoyable watching the replay than when I watched it live in 2006. Y you know why? Because I knew how it ended. <laughs> I would have never thought that, but it's true. By knowing the outcome of Texas winning, I could pay more attention to the details of the game and in total enjoy the journey all the way through the final play. It was really more fun watching it the second time around because I knew how it ended. Now, this isn't unusual because there was a study done by two researchers at the University of California to suggest that spoilers don't actually spoil stories. <laughs> they ran three experiments with 12 short stories and they found that people consistently enjoyed a story more when they knew the ending rather than reading the story with a sense of suspense. Now, even though the test subjects categorically said uh, that they did not like spoilers, the data actually showed differently. To explain this phenomenon, one of the researchers theorized this. He said it could be that once you know how the story turns out, you're more comfortable with processing the information and you can focus on a deeper understanding of the story so you're enjoying it a little bit more. And you know what? Now that I think about it, I do really honestly think that that's true. 
we may not want to know exactly how the book or the movie ends, but we do want to be able to trust the author or the director enough to know that they're taking us on this journey that may be perilous at times, of course, but ends well for us. You know, with justice and with love and with redemption somehow winning the day. So if we know how the book ends or if we know how the story ends or the movie ends, we can just enjoy that narrative a little differently. In Romans chapter 8, Paul super reminds us of these things. He teaches us that we can trust in the author of the story, and instead of fear, we can have faith that brings uh, that that things that are, that things are leading us to a great ending. Now look at now look. Some of you may find yourself in a part of your story that you never dreamed that would be written about you. Maybe you're in the middle of a chapter that is uninvited, uh, that you didn't want to begin with. Maybe it's a chapter titled divorce, or it's a chapter titled abuse, or maybe a chapter titled terminal, uh, a chapter titled fired, or bankrupt, or unemployed. Romans chapter 8 has a promise specifically for you. And it's a promise that I know that many of us have heard before. Here is what he says. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, this sounds like a really beautiful and incredible promise on the surface. We know that in all things, God works for the good, right? But look, the lens through which you read this promise, makes really all the difference in the world. This is a beautiful promise, granted, unless it's your marriage that is falling apart, right? Unless it's your home that is broken. Unless it's your health that is, uh, um, sorry, it's your health that is failing, or it's your child who is sick or struggling, or it's your job that that is being eliminated. If that's the case, then this promise suddenly doesn't become and seem so quite comforting, and at best, it seems inconsistent. At worst, it seems offensive, maybe, because what's going on in your life is so strong, it so strongly contradicts the very promise that Scripture is telling you that we don't understand the promise, or oftentimes, we won't even believe it. Through the lenses of loss or struggle or sickness, we often just end up shouting in frustration, how can he, how can God say that all things work together for good given what I am facing, given what is happening to me, given what I am going through? It flies directly in the face of the promise that you made in Romans 8, God. Well, I just want to tell you, if you feel that way, you're not alone. The church in Rome who first received these words could surely have told their own stories as well. They were experiencing intense persecution. Because of their faith, they lost income. Because of their faith, they lost family relationships. Because of their faith, some of them lost their lives. They loved God, and they were recalled according to his purpose. And because they loved God, and they were recalled according to his purpose, they faced these bad things. Because they loved God, and they were experiencing these hardships, I mean, it just seems like that's the opposite of what should have been happening for them, right? But Paul says in all things, God works together for good. How can he say that and yet there be persecution of Christians? Maybe he was just kind of this uh, positive preacher guy, right? Had a smile on his face, just trancing through life. Wants us to practice the power of positive thinking. Maybe, you know, he's just begging us, you know, if we could just see the glass half full. If we could just see the good in all things, if we could just pretend that it's sunny outside even though it's really not, well, you know what? 
that doesn't really make sense to me because before this scripture and after this scripture, Paul goes out of his way to really super acknowledge the reality that life is hard. Now, I want you to notice in that scripture the phrase, we know. Now, the Greek word that that comes from is oida, and it translates into we know. And so it's used 13 times in the book of Romans, and it does not mean hopefully. That word does not mean optimistically thinking. That word does not mean maybe. It doesn't mean wouldn't it be great if this happened. What it means is, it means with absolute certainty. So Paul really is not speaking optimistically here. He's not just being this positive person saying, you know, uh, uh, it's just going to be all right or it's just going to be good or everything's going to work out. No, what he's saying is, no, we know, we know, we know that in all things God works for the good. The same word, odai, is used uh, one other time in Romans chapter 8 in verse 22. Now, we studied that scripture last week, and he said there, we know, we know that the whole creation has been groaning. So what he is saying in verse 22 is he is saying, we know without question that life is hard. And then he goes to verse 28 that we're looking at this morning, and he says, and we know with absolute confidence that God is good. Well, how do you put those two things together? Well, let's look at first what his promises don't say. His promises don't say that if you love God and are called according to his purposes, then everything that happens to you will be good. Now look, I get it. Many Christians implicitly believe that this truly is the case, that if I love God, if I'm called according to his purpose, if I do enough good, then bad things won't happen to me and good things will happen to me. Well, honestly, guys, that's not in the Bible and that's not in this promise. Instead, what we're told is we are told by this promise to look for God's good purpose to come out of life's hard pain. Let me repeat that again. To look for God's good purpose to come out of life's hard pain. Now, it's helpful for us at this point really to make a distinction between reason and and between purpose. Now, when someone goes through something very difficult in life, many of us just want to say there's always a reason for it. And look, I've said this many times in trying to comfort a friend who is struggling. I've said things like God has his reasons or there is a reason for everything. I mean, we do really just want to believe that there is a reason for everything. But in fact, God doesn't really have a reason for everything. Now, follow me for just a minute. If there really is a reason for everything, often then the pain that we experience aren't God's reasons at all. It's sin. That's the reason. A fallen world, that's the reason. In John, it says that we have an enemy who comes to kill and come to steal and comes to destroy us. That's the reason. So instead of thinking God is the reason for the hurt, rather think that God gives purpose to the hurt. See, these are two entirely different things. Reason looks for a because. It wants to answer the question, why? This happened because of this, X, Y, or Z. But purpose, what purpose gives us is it gives us the for. Reason wants to make sense out of something that happened. But purpose offers us the hope that whatever happened, whatever happened, God can still work for good. From Scripture, you may remember the story of the man who was blind, and when the disciples met him, guess what? They wanted to know, why? Why did this happen to this guy? What's the reason for this man's blindness? Or in the other story, remember where the, the tower falls 
and I think it was, uh, it's found in Luke in the parables, I think it was 18 uh, innocent people uh, were, 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 were killed when the tower fell, and, and they go right there, they ask why. Why did this happen? But what we see Jesus doing is we see Jesus quickly shifting the focus from why did this happen to what's God going to do through this. It's a different way to look at it. Instead of looking at it and asking for a reason, we look at it and we ask for purpose. This has happened. So God how will you work this for good? We go on to Romans 8, 29, and 30. For, now, this gets, <laughs> this gets really kind of convoluted. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. <laughs> that, just, that sounds like a really bad, huge run on sentence, right? But so let's just take a, a second here, and let's just define some terms. And I've got a couple of takeaways uh, for you from this about how God is going to work for good in all things if, and here's the if, if you love him, and if you are called according to his purpose. So the first word to define here is the word foreknew, right? For those God foreknew. Now, this is speaking of, of God's all-knowing ability. And so he sees things differently than we do. We see things in this linear fashion, right? One event unfolds into another event that unfolds into another event, <clears throat> We see everything is having a beginning and a middle uh, and an end. But God sees the whole picture. And not only does he see the whole picture, he sees it all at once. He lives outside of time and space. And though I don't understand that because I am not God and because I don't live outside of time and space, God does. And he knows, he knows, he knows, he knows what has happened, and he knows what is happening, and he knows what will happen. Isaiah 46, verse 9, gives us a little more help here where he says, I am God, and there is none like me. So what God is saying to me and to you is that you're not like me. You don't see what I see. You don't know what I know. You don't have the perspective that I have. And then God goes on to say in that verse, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still yet to come. God is saying, I know everything that has happened. And guess what? I know everything that will happen. Well, that sounds great, Todd, but what does that mean for my story? Here's what it means. You're never going to be in a chapter of your story where God says, I didn't see that coming. Oh, that surprised me. That's not part of his vocabulary. He knows it all. He knows who's going to win every presidential election from now until Jesus' return. God knows the hair color and favorite fruits of your great, 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 great grandchildren. He knows it all. And because he knows everything, nothing catches him off guard. 1 Peter chapter 1 even furthermore helps us connect the dots here. God's foreknowledge means that he knew who his chosen sons and daughters would be. Look at 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. It says, to God's elect, and by that he means his believers who have... Uh, and it, it goes on to, to list some cities and stuff, but who have been chosen according to what? Chose according to, in Scripture it says, the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, I'm, I'm a Wesleyan, I'm an Armenian, I'm not a Calvinist, so hang with me a little bit here. So if you are a Christian, God chose you because of his foreknowledge. He knew that you would come to Jesus because of his foreknowledge. So there is comfort in knowing that nothing happens uh, that catches God off God. Now, look, here's why that really matters for us. If we go to the next word, predestined, right? 
in verse 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined. God's predestination is based on his foreknowledge because God knows in advance. God can predestine or God can preordain everything that happens to us as Christians. It doesn't say that he causes everything that happens to us. It says that he predestines it. What that means is, is that the outcome is already determined for us as Christians. This means that if we are Christians, this turns out well, no matter what happens to us. So everything that happens to us, all things, be they good or be they bad, will do what? They will help us to be conformed to the image of the Son of God. They will make us more like Jesus Christ. Now, look, God's knowledge means that whatever happens in the future is certain, of course, right? But it's not his knowledge, and I want to be very clear about this. It is not his knowledge that causes those things to happen. But whatever will happen, he uses those things to accomplish his purpose. Now, look, to me, this is the highest level of his sovereignty and his power, that God can take whatever happens, and he, in his sovereignty and in his power, can use that whatever happened to accomplish his work and his purpose in your life and in my life. Then we go to look at the next word that I think is important, and it's called. Now, this is going to be maybe a little different than we have heard the word called before or, or understand the word calling. For many of us, that's a vocational a term of something that God has intended for us to do or like a missionary or like a pastor or like a, uh, you know, a volunteer that's uh, working in this ministry. But listen to Romans chapter 8. It says this, those he foreknew, he predestined. Then those he predestined, he called. The idea here is that we don't get to really take any credit guys for coming to Christ that you know he is the one who opened our eyes and in Wesleyan theology that would be prevenient grace the grace that goes before the grace that woos us and he is the one who extended the invitation to us and he is the one who made the way when there was no way the Bible tells us in, in first John we love God because of what because he first loved us I mean, we get to choose God because why? Because God first chose us. He reached out to us. The Bible says, while we were still yet sinners, he reached for us. Think of it as the train, right? You have, you, there's a train that's on a track, and it has a destination. And now look, the only way that you can get to that destination is by this train that's on this track. And it's not going to deviate. I mean, this, you get on that train, you're going to arrive at that destination, all right? So once you get on that train, you are predestined to arrive at that destination. Here's the deal. And here's what separa separates, you know, us from my, my Calvinist brothers and sisters is this, is that I, I just believe that everybody... Uh, has the choice that everybody is offered a spot to get on that train. Some would say that only some are elected or chosen to get on that train. I think everybody is given a choice, offered a spot to get on that train. And so once you get on that train, you are predestined to that destination, to being like Christ. Now look, the next word that we talk about is the word justified. Now, this is how Jesus makes us right before God. You may have heard it just as if I'd never sinned before. That's because of the sacrifice that Christ and I, uh, that Christ made and that we stand before God without any blemish or without any sin, without any defect. Not because I earned it, not because you earned it, not because I deserved it, not because you deserved it, but because Jesus paid for it with his own blood. So the Bible says that we are justified by his grace through faith in Jesus Christ. The next word then that we see in the scripture in 30 is the word glorified. Those he foreknew, he predestined. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. And those that he justified, he glorified. So here's what Paul's saying. 
this is great news. This is the final chapter of the story. This is where everything is leading to a chapter titled Glorified. And guess what? It's the chapter that never ends. So whatever chapter you may be in right now in your life, let me tell you, if you're a Christian, where the story is headed. Let me just share with you and tell you the direction things are going to go for you. If you love God, and if you were called, as in the way that Paul uses called in the sense here in Romans chapter 8, according to his purpose, it's going to end well with the chapter called glorified. And that begins the chapter that never ends. And so we have this confidence. So we can have this faith instead of fear because we know how our story ends. Now, God working good in all things God working in all things good God doing good no matter what happened no matter what's occurring God doing good in that situation here's what that's going to do to us the first thing is it's going to draw us closer to him no matter what is happening the second thing when God is going to work all things uh, for good for those who believe it's going to make us more like Jesus no matter the situation and the third thing that is going to happen when God is working that good in all circumstances it that is going to take us to be with Jesus guaranteed now look I don't want to be one of those people who tries to offer this one minute secret to solving life's most difficult challenges, you know. In, instead, I would just much prefer uh, to point you to the author and tell you to trust the end of this story. Uh, as I close, uh, there, there's an illustration that's been around for a long time. I first heard it from Corey Ten Boone. Now, Corey, she was a committed Christian lady who experienced the sufferings of the concentration camps because, you know, she was holding and rescuing Jews. And I, ha I couldn't find this. I have to paraphrase it. But here's what she said. We watch life unfold, and we view it like we are viewing the backside of a tapestry. It appears from our perspective in the knotted, seemingly random sense that nothing really makes sense. We don't understand it, but things are not always as they seem. It's only when you turn the tapestry over that you see the art and the rich colors and the texture and the patterns, and you find out that it is truly a thing of beauty. I know right now, for some of you, man, all you can see is the back of the tapestry and the threads you know that seem frayed and the knots and it just doesn't look like there's any pattern at all but there will be a day and I promise you this that we get to see the other side we get to see that there is one who is weaving it all together it turns out he knows precisely what he is doing. So God is the master weaver. He weaves all things together. And look, if we love him and are called according to his purpose, he weaves all things together for our eternal good and his ultimate glory. I love you guys very much. God in all things can work good no matter what you find yourself in don't give up let's pray father we thank you lord that you are the true good 
God for us, Lord, that you are not a liar, Father, that this promise, though <laughs> it doesn't seem when we are really facing the stress, it doesn't seem when we are really under the gun, when it doesn't seem that we are really just taking it from all sides, that you're working any good in any of it, God. But, Lord, you are. We may just be seeing the back of the tapestry, the knots and the tanglements, nothing that looks right or has a pattern. But, Lord, the good work that you began in us, in our lives, you are going to finish, and you're going to turn that tapestry over, and it's going to be beautiful, Father. So I want to pray for encouragement, Lord, for those that find themselves in a chapter today that they never expected to be in, a chapter today that is being written that they thought they would never help write, God. Lord, for a chapter today that they never wanted. Lord, I want to pray for them right now, God. Father, that they would hear the entirety of this promise. Lord, that they would know that you love them very much and that they are not alone and that you are the master weaver, and though they may not feel it, though they may not know it, though they may not sense it, though they may not see it, you are working good. You are working in all things good, God. So we love you, and we trust you, and we need you, Lord. Thank you, God, for loving us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask if... Uh, Don will come up, and Don is uh, uh, going to lead us through um, our love feast together. And Don, I just I want to let you know, man, thank you very much, and I love you very much. Oh, sorry, I pulled that in now. There you go. Thank you, brother. It's on. Once again, it's a custom here at St. Matthew on the first Sunday of each month to celebrate the Lord's Supper. That's sort of common for our United Methodist churches. But uh, given the fact that one of the elements for the Lord's Supper is missing, which is the gathered community, um, we're not going to celebrate Holy Communion, the sacrament. What we do instead in the interim until we're back together next month, I believe, uh, is to uh, um, share together, um, and I invite you to grab some chips or crackers at your home or whatever you have and, and choose to have in, in front of you, uh, some water or grape juice or your favorite beverage, whatever that might be, soda pop or whatever, um, and um, share in this what we call the love feast. I actually was doing a little research on John Wesley, John and Charles, and their use of the love feast uh, recently, very recently, in fact, last night, and found that it was introduced to them when they were missionaries in Georgia, in the colony of Georgia, in 1737 and 1738. They were English, but they'd come over to the colony of Georgia to do mission work for a while. And they intended to do mission work with the Indians and were found that to be di very difficult. And, and in fact, came to work more and to get to know more some of the uh, English colonists and also a group from Germany called the Moravians. Now, the Moravians were not institutional. They were not part of an institutional church. They were somewhat uh, marginalized from the Lutheran movement in Germany, so they found a, a place of peace where they could make their own way, first in England and then in, in the colony of Georgia. And so one of their disciplines was a, a simple meal, a communal meal that they would share believers, and they called it the love feast. And here's the way John Wesley described his participation in the love feast. This was in August of 1737. After evening prayers, we joined with the Germans in one of their love feasts. 
It was begun and ended with thanksgiving and prayer and celebrated, listen to this, this is kind of cool, and celebrated in so decent and solemn a manner as a Christian of the apostolical age would have allowed to be worthy of Christ. Also, I was looking at that um, part of what uh, the Moravians did when they gathered for love feast was have holy conversation. And they carried that over into Wesley's tradition as well. I want to have a little brief conversation with you this morning. It's going to be a one-sided conversation. I looked up another passage of John Wesley's journal a few weeks before his encounter with the Moravians and their love feasts. He was um, feasting with an African slave in Georgia. And he was telling them about the promise that he believed in, that he would be glorified at the time of his death. And he asked this African slave if, if he didn't believe the same thing. He asked him to look at his hands and his feet and, and say, what's going to happen to your soul when you pass away? And your hands and your feet and your body is no more. African slave said he believed that he would be, uh, would go live up there. And um, so Wesley said to him, just as the apostle said to the Ethiopian in, in um, 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 the book of Acts, that you will be also a citizen of heaven. You remember the Ethiopian said, what's to, what's to prevent me from being baptized? <laughs> well, let's find some water. But I was struck by that, and Wesley had an ongoing ministry with uh, African slaves in America. And then when he returned to England the next year in 1738, the Wesleyan Methodist movement always included Africans, or what he called at that time, of course, Negroes. They weren't slaves in England. We can celebrate that. They were free men and women who'd come. Many of them had come from the Caribbean and had gotten their freedom in one way or another and had come back to England. From the very beginning, the Wesleyan movement, they were a part of it. They were uh, in the select society, which was the group of committed Wesleyans who met together every week. They were a part of his baptismal ceremonies. When he baptized, he included the Negroes, as he called them. And from the very beginning, and another thing that John Wesley was very prominent in was the fight against the slave trade. England would, did not have slavery, but many of the, the sh ship, the people who owned the shipping were involved in trading slaves from Africa to America. Wesley preached and stood against the slave trade throughout his long career. Even so that William Wilberforce, who was responsible more than anyone else in England in abolishing the slave trade, was a disciple of John Wesley. What I want to say as a result of this kind of, or as a summary in this kind of statement about our Wesleyan tradition is brothers and sisters today. Black lives matter. They matter to our heritage. They matter to our community. They matter to our church. And when we see that our brothers and sisters of African American descent, when they suffer, we suffer with them. 
and that's our history of 300 years, and that's who we are today. And they're here with us in our love feasts. They're with us on our conscience. They're with us in our hearts. So as we break bread or share in this uh, love feast today, let's remember especially our African brothers and sisters, our African-American brothers and sisters. Together, let us pray as we share this, these elements for the people gathered around this table, for those who suffer and those in trouble, for the concerns of this local community, for the world, its peoples, and its leaders, for the church universal, its leaders, its members, and its mission. In communion with the saints, we pray, and we hear again this hymn of, of Charles Wesley, Father of earth and heaven, thy hungry children feed. Thy grace be to our spirits given, that true immortal bread. Grant us and all our race, our human race, in Jesus Christ to prove the sweetness of thy pardoning grace, the manna of thy love. Amen. So we share these elements and invite any in the gathered group here to come and share if you want to and uh, invite you to do the same at home. Thank you, Don, so much, man. Really good. Really, really good. Uh, as we come to close our service today, I just want to encourage you. Uh, we're going to sing another praise song together. So wherever you are right now, uh, just, just lift your praises up to God uh, and give him all of the, the praise this morning for us. So here we go, guys. child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God You unravel me with the melody
Amen. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, I just want to remind you next Sunday, uh, we are opening uh, back up just for worship services. You will receive an email with the details about how the reservations work with that and what all we're doing to prepare uh, for our church family, those that want and feel comfortable to come back together and worship with us. But listen, we are also doing our online worship as well, and we are not going to change. We will run it at the same time. And so if you don't feel comfortable being here with us, right now if you don't if you are in one of the high risk categories or uh you just it's just uh, just something that uh, you just want to wait on that is completely fine no problems no worries about that you can still find us online at this hour on sunday as well so check your email be watching for the correspondence coming from us about the details of how you can attend here if you want to come and also feel super encouraged and blessed if you still just want to stay at home and catch us online as well love you guys i'm so glad that all of you could come and join us today i want to thank the praise team, the media team, everybody involved on putting this together today. Guys, I love you guys. Thank y'all so much. And guess what? God loves us more and God loves you more too. Accept this benediction. Father God, thank you for the presence that you have in our lives, for the promises that you make to our lives, God. Let us live out of that promise that you give us each and every day. We love you, God. Thank you for loving us more. And all of God's people said... Amen. See you later. Have a great, great week.